Hi everybody, it's your AP Biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are starting the last topic of the first unit of the class on chemistry of life. And we are getting into the biggest one here, and this is proteins. And to me, it is absolutely criminal that the first thing that most people think of when they hear the word protein is like, yeah, I'm building muscle, I'm getting more protein in my diet. You need more protein for more muscle. And that protein is really the only thing that's, or the only thing that's associated with protein um, in common knowledge is uh, is building muscle and getting stronger. Oh, that's your muscles. And that is ridiculous to me because proteins are amazingly complex in terms of their structure and function. In fact, nobody's ever even figured out um, how exactly proteins are put together. Um, it's taking, we've, science has made amazing, amazing strides in the last couple of years about how proteins are actually uh, built and the very, very specific minutia of the structure of a protein. Um, but they're so, so complicated and they're to de just get boiled down into like, oh, they're for muscle is ridiculous to me because proteins literally do everything for a cell. Cells are protein robots to uh, quote a video that I saw once on YouTube. Um, but here is my definition. They are organic macromolecules made of linear chains of amino acid monomers. All right. Notice how I'm not putting a function here. Like, oh, this is what proteins do. Because you remember how I said lipids are kind of a mixed bag of, uh, of varieties of functions and shapes. Yeah, it doesn't have th th those don't the varieties of lipids. Um, in terms of their function does not hold a candle to the varieties of proteins and their functions. Fro proteins do everything for a cell. Everything that a, a living thing can do is because of its proteins. Um, and pr all proteins, all right, be the proteins in bacteria, in human beings, in mushrooms, in, I don't know, dragonflies are all made of 20 different um, amino acids. Every protein is a chain of amino acids. So therefore the monomer of a protein is an amino acid. Um, this this little structure right here um, is looking at a chain of amino acids. And when you get a whole lot of amino acids and they start interacting in weird ways, um, and that helps to maintain the shape of the protein. Um, so here we have to understand in order to get how a protein is able to fold and how a protein works and how important the structure of a protein is for its function, we have to understand the structure of an amino acid. And here is your generalized amino acid. And there are some I'm going to say four components that I'm going to ask you to know. Uh, one is an amino group, all right? When you see an NH2 on here, N is for nitrogen, H is for hydrogen. When you see an NH2 uh, attached to a molecule like this, it is called an amino group. And this is actually why it's called an amino acid. Um, and the, on the other side, we've seen this before when we were looking at uh, fatty acids. This is what's called a carboxyl group. It's a carbon with double bonded to an oxygen and then a hydroxyl group there. Um, and in the middle is that, uh, I'm going to point it out here in a second, is a central carbon. Uh, so the central carbon has a hydrogen, has the amino group, it has a carboxyl group, and then this R here, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Okay, but uh, peptide bonds are the names of the bonds that form, the covalent bonds that form between the carboxyl group of one amino acid and um, the amino group of another amino acid. So those bond together, okay? And like I've said a million times, all right, if, a, if an amino acid is a monomer, then you have to make a polymer, you have to link a bunch of them together, all right? And those links, those special names for those covalent bonds that are formed by dehydration synthesis between the co carboxyl group of one amino acid and the amino group of the other amino acid are called peptide bonds, all right? And when you get a whole bunch of amino acids into a chain, it starts to form what's called a polypeptide. Um, so that's two important parts of the amino acid. Um, the backbone of the amino acid is what we call kind of like how DNA has a backbone. Um, amino acids have a backbone too. Um, and then this part does something pretty interesting. Okay, the backbone of the amino acid, I'm going to try and highlight it here, um, is this part right there, okay? Um, the amino group, the central carbon, and the carboxyl group. Um, and those are going to have to some kind of interesting interactions with each other, but not quite as interesting as this thing right here, the amino acid side chain, or what's called the R group. Um, you may know already, hopefully you have some kind of chemistry background before taking this class, um, that R is in fact not on the periodic table. R is not an element. So what is R? Well, it's a variable, kind of like in algebra, like X is a variable. R is a variable in uh in science. Now, hold on, before we get into math here, I don't want to, I don't want it to go, you know, too much. I don't want to go in that direction. Okay. But all I'm trying to say is that R could be 20 different 
compounds, um, 20 different things with different, uh, with different properties. So therefore, all amino acids have this amino group, have the central carbon, have the carboxyl group, but there's 20 different amino acids and their only difference is this R group right here. Okay, so as uh, this chart shows you, there are 20 different attachments that could be added to uh, the backbone of an amino acid. All right, um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them that are hydrophobic or nonpolar, kind of like a lipid. Um, there are four of them that are polar, like water or like uh, carbohydrates, for example, those are polar. Um, and there are some that are positively and negatively charged. And then there's some special cases over here that interact kind of weirdly with all of them. Um, but there's some positively and negatively charged ones over here. Um, and it looks like I put my face in front of the words over here, so I might have to fix that. But here's an important point. How our groups interact with each other determine the structure and therefore the function of part of a protein or in sometimes all of the protein, okay? So how these R groups interact with each other, okay? Remember, now, uh, polar and nonpolar, we talked about this in our lipids topic, polar and po nonpolar don't interact with each other, okay? Oil does not mix with water. They don't, they don't like each other, right? It's a, that's why we call it hydrophobic. But polar substances, okay, are totally cool with each other. Like, for example, you can dissolve uh, sugar in water because sugar is polar and so is water, right? Hydrophobic uh, molecules don't interact with each other. Hydrophilic inter molecules or polar molecules interact with each other, but hydrophobic and hydrophilic do not interact with each other. Okay, similarly, positively charged ions don't, they repel from each other, but positively and negatively charged ions, they attract to each other. Okay, so these interactions here are going to have a huge impact on the shape of a protein. So here's a, some big, big points that I wanna tell you here, ready? The sequence of an amino acids determines the positions of the R groups, and each of those R groups has a different property, okay? So the sequence or the actual order in which amino acids are put together, all right? Um, has a big deal, is a big deal because of those R groups. Where those R groups are determine how those amino acids in a big long chain are going to interact with each other. Are they going to repel from each other? Are they going to attract to each other, et cetera? Okay, um, and the way those R groups interact with each other determine how the protein is shaped. How is it, how is this long chain going to become one functional block of protein that's determined by the R, uh, the R group interactions, okay? And then finally, how a protein is shaped determines its function. Now, at the beginning of the video, I didn't say, oh, this is what proteins do. I say proteins do everything, right? Proteins do everything because there are so many different shapes to them. Okay, there's a there's uh, enzymes, there's structural proteins, there's antibodies, there's antigens, there's um, ligands, there's receptors, there's pro ion channels, there's ridiculous variety of proteins um, in living things, and they're able to do so many different things because of their so many different shapes. So the shape of a protein determines its function, and that is an absolutely key point that I'm going to have you remember. Okay, um, now. When we're talking about proteins, we can talk about how a protein is built at four different structures. There's primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. And be, we talk about these four different structures of protein or levels of protein structure because the structure of a protein is so important um, for its function, all right? If you adjust the shape of a protein in just a little tiny way, it might throw off the function of the entire protein. It might not be able to do its job, okay? And proteins do like I said, everything, the number of, we're going to talk about so many different enzymes and proteins um, in this class and what they do, okay? And they can only do their job if they're properly shaped, all right? And as soon as you throw off the shape, it can't do its job anymore, all right? So this is very important here, ready? The sequence of amino acids in a protein is called its primary structure, all right? So here's a bunch of amino acids. These are, are, are the shorthands for amino acids. We'll become hopefully a little bit more familiar with these in unit six. Um, but here's glycine, proline, threonine, all right? And this is uh, the order of these amino acids um, determines, well, how they, the, the protein shape. And then we're going to see that in just a second here, okay? Here's the amino end of one protein and the carboxyl end of the uh, polypeptide is on the other side, okay? Now, um, how a protein folds because of the hydrogen bonds forming between the amino acid backbones in that long chain is called its secondary structure, Okay, so once you start to get this really, really long chain of proteins, well, it starts to kind of fold in on itself and form these weird shapes. 
um, not because of the R groups yet, but because of the backbones. Remember the central carb and the amino acid, or excuse me, the amino group and the carboxyl group of those amino acids. They start to interact and form hydrogen bonds with each other um, in different ways, all right? And the two main ways that I'm gonna have you know uh, that um, secondary structure, the, some examples of secondary structures due to the interaction between those backbones are an alpha helix, which I highlighted in green over here. This is what's called an alpha helix. I don't know how to put the Greek letter into my program here, so I, it would be there. All right, and then um, this kind of jagged, kind of like foldy, flat part, um, this is what's called a beta pleated sheet. Um, pleated means it's kind of like folded, like zigzagged a little bit. Um, anyway, so secondary structure, how a protein starts to fold after it's just, you know, one chain um, is determined by its uh, interactions between the amino acids backbones. That's called a secondary structure. Now, where it gets interesting here is the tertiary structure, a protein 3D shape, three dimensional shape. Um, is determined by R group or what we call side chain interactions. Okay, so all those different side chains, those R groups, all right, there's nonpolar, polar, positive, negative um, amino acids, they're all going to push and pull on each other in different ways. And here's four examples of how they interact with each other right here in this picture. Okay, so check it out. There's an amino acid right here that has a nonpolar R group. There's an amino acid right here that has a nonpolar R group. Um, and they're going to actually kind of connect to each other because of what are called hydrophobic interactions. Nonpolar things tend to like nonpolar things and they're going to kind of pull on each other because of that. Um, and disulfide bridges, I'm, again, it looks like my face is blocking it, sorry. Uh, but disulfide bridges can form between two sulfur-containing R groups. All right, so uh, an amino acid called cysteine, I can't think of the other one. Um, they have sulfur, all right? And what tends to happen sometimes, these sulfur atoms tend to form covalent bonds, and that's what's called a disulfide bridge. And that can pull two ends of a amino acid chain together, um, kind of like what you're seeing in the picture here. Two other interactions that you're probably going to see, check it out. Um, if I have two polar um, amino acids, they can form hydrogen bonds between each other. Remember how way back at the beginning of the unit, uh, we talked about water being polar and polar molecules kind of pulling on each other because of the positive and negative ends are kind of attracting together. Same deal over here. All right, hydrogen bonds forming between the polar R groups can cause those uh, those amino acid chains to pull on each other and attract to each other too, um, can cause that protein to start to fold up at, um, and form 3D shapes. And then finally, you know, if you have a positive and a negatively charged amino acid, they're going to pull on each other and they can actually form an ionic bond. Um, which is a really, really strong type of bond. Um, and that can form between those oppositely charged R groups and pull that amino acids or the amino acid chains together as well. Um, so there's four different uh, interactions that you can see. Hydrophobic interactions, disulfide bridges, you can see um, hydrogen bonds, and you can see ionic bonds forming. And that's all going to determine the structure of a uh, a protein. Now, the fourth level of protein structure is what's called quaternary protein structure, and that is determined by the interactions between multiple polypeptides. Everything that we've talked about so far is just the formation of polypeptides, all right? But if most proteins, all right, especially the really big ones, like say, I think this one, for example, is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that carries oxygen um, in your blood. It's actually what makes your blood red. Um, it is determined by the structure, the, the structure of hemoglobin um, is made up of four different polypeptides that are all bonded together. And now this is a fully functional hemoglobin protein that can carry oxygen all the way from your lungs back to your heart and to your brain to the rest of your body. Um, so here's the deal of that. When polypeptides interact, that is called quaternary structure, and all four levels of stru structure determine the protein's function. Oops, it looks like I put that on there twice. That's my bad. Um, but there you have it, okay? So you have primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. Once again, primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. Um, the secondary structure is how that uh, amino acids start to coil and kind of bend a little bit um, on account of the interactions between the backbones of the amino acids. The tertiary structure is determined how the polypeptide folds over in on itself, is determined by how the R groups interact or the uh, side chains interact with each other, whether they're pulling on each other or pushing each other apart. Um, we can talk about disulfide interactions. Uh, hydrophobic interactions, hydrogen bonds, and um, ionic bonds forming between them and to start to make the shape of a protein. And then the quaternary structure is how multiple polypeptides all work together and fold together.
Okay. Uh, so here's a recap, just in case you missed anything, or just in case I missed anything. Uh, proteins, what they are, they are made of chains of amino acid monomers. All amino acids have an amino group, which is the NH2, and a carboxyl group that link to adjacent amino acids via covalent peptide bonds. All right, so peptide bonds are those that the bonds that form between the amino acids. All right, so if I'm looking at my primary structure over here, all right, between each one of these amino acids is a peptide bond between the amino and the carboxyl group. Um, all amino acids have a variable R group or a side chain. It can be 20 different things. Um, and so those 20 different things could be nonpolar, they could be polar, or they could be positively and negatively charged. And that determines everything. The sequence of the amino acids therefore determines the shape and therefore the function of the protein. All right, how those R groups interact with each other is super duper important. Um, but anyway, primary structure, uh, for uh, describing the primary structure of a protein, it's the protein's amino acid sequence. The secondary structure is how the protein um, amino acids backbones interact and cause folds. They start to cause these uh, twisting shapes that, that's called the alpha helix or this bending shape called a beta sh pleated sheet. Um, the tertiary structure, this is the really big part, is how a protein's 3D shape is affected um, by how the R groups interact with each other. Um, and those are those four that we just listed before, the disulfide bridges, ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions. Um, and then how those polypeptides interact with each other determines what's called a quaternary structure. All right, that is it for this unit. Um, that is it for 1.7. There was a lot to unpack in this video and it gets kind of complicated. So please let me know if you have any questions and we will see you later for unit two.